We're on week three of this 31 session, episode, story, working through the Bible from Genesis to Revelation from September 14th to May 17th. We're looking at the God's relentless pursuit to get us back. The first week we looked at Genesis and the whole garden, the beginning of life as we know it. Last week we looked at the story of Abraham and Abraham's detours here and there, but Abraham was a man of faith who went when God called him. Today we're looking at Joseph, and we're looking at two important lessons from Joseph's life. First, that God was with Joseph. We see that again and again through the story of Joseph, Genesis 37 through 50, where it says the Lord was with him. It's kind of a new thing. The Lord was with Joseph in a different way than the Lord was with Abraham and those who went before him. The Lord was with Joseph is an important biblical insight we learn. And also from the story of Joseph, we learn a life lesson that the quality of our lives depends on how we respond to life's challenges and difficulties. We'll see how both of those come to play. One, that the Lord was with Joseph. Second, that the quality of his life depended on how he responded to life's challenges and difficulties. The story of Joseph, 37 through 50 in Genesis, is kind of like a five-act play. And there's five phases in Joseph's life, from a son to a slave, from a slave to a prisoner, from a prisoner to a ruler, and from a ruler to the patriarch of all Egypt. Those five separate distinct phases are what we see in the life of Joseph. It's a massively interesting story of redemption, and it shows how God was with Joseph. It shows that the quality of his life depended on how he responded to this multitudinous uh, challenges and problems that came into his life. Now, briefly, let's take a two-minute overview of a uh, brief history of who Joseph is. We remember Father Abraham that we talked about last week, that God said God would bless. When he's 90 or 100 years old, he and Sarah had a child of the promise, Isaac. Remember that? And Isaac was the one that Abraham was called to sacrifice on Mount Moriah in Genesis 21. Isaac then had twins, Jacob and Esau. Remember, they were born and were one right after the other, and Esau was the firstborn. Esau was the one who was to inherit the family farm, but since Isaac kind of raised a dysfunctional family, he favored the younger one, Jacob, over Esau, and they stole the blessing. You remember that whole story. Jacob, when he's on the run, uh, Jacob's name would later be changed to Israel. And I'll be using those a little bit interchangeably during this time. Jacob's name was going to be changed to Israel. Jacob, remember, was on the run from God after he stole the birthright from Esau. He had the climbing Jacob's ladder. He had the wrestling with the angels. Then finally, uh, Jacob was able to have 12 sons, actually with, with four different women, two wives and two concubines. And those 12 sons became the 12 tribes of Israel. So that's bringing us to this point. Joseph was the second to the last one born of his father Jacob's favorite wife, Rachel. Benjamin was the youngest and was the second son, last son born to his favorite wife, Rachel. Well, you know, you just kind of sense from the outgo in Joseph that he grew up in a dysfunctional family. His biological mom was dead. He's living with uh, three stepmoms under the same roof. He's got a younger brother, Benjamin, and ten older brothers, and there's a whole lot of rivalry going on in that home. Joseph's father, Jacob, or Israel, loved Joseph the most. In fact, he gave him this multicolored robe um, for him to wear. It wasn't just a coat, it was a statement. A statement saying, yeah, you guys wear burlap. You know, but wear your burlap. Joseph is going to get this multicolored dream coat. Joseph was being told by his father Israel, 
Let there be no doubt. This son is my favorite. I love him the most. He is going to inherit the family farm. And he's not going to wear a working man's coat like the burlap his brothers wear. He's going to wear this multicolored dream coat. He's not going to work in the field. He's going to sit home, eat bonbons, and watch TV. This work stuff, that's up to the less favored sons. I mean, think about it. It would be like having 12 kids, and on Christmas morning, you give 11 of them a coloring book to share with knockoff crayons, but you give your favorite son an iPad, an iPhone 6, and an Apple Watch. It's like Joseph got to go to summer camp. His brothers got summer jobs. Joseph got Armani. His brothers got Kmart Blue Light Specials. In verse 3, it says, Israel loved Joseph more than any of his other sons. Really, his father loved Joseph more than all of them put together. It was sibling rivalry in a dysfunctional household. But one night, Joseph had a dream. In between uh, those two parts of our first lesson for today, Joseph had a dream. One day, Joseph told his brothers what he had dreamed, and they hated him even more. Joseph said to them, let me tell you about my dream. <laughs> you know, kind of little, let me rub a little salt in your wound as long as you're hating me. He says, we were all out in the field tying up some bundles of wheat. Suddenly, my bundle stood up, and your bundles gathered around and bowed down. His brother said, do you really think you're going to be king and rule over us? Now they hated Joseph even more about his dream. Joseph later had a dream and told his brothers, listen to what else I dreamed. The sun, moon, and the eleven stars, you bowed down to me. So he told his father about the dream. His father became angry and said, what is that supposed to mean? Are your mother and I and your brothers going to come and bow down to you? Joseph's brothers were jealous of him. But his father kept wondering about the dream. That was the beginning dream that Joseph had. Notice that this dream wasn't too well received. Notice three different reactions to the dream. First of all, there's a response of Joseph. He dreams and he immediately goes and shares it. He says, you guys are all going to bow down to me. He gets it. The first thing he does is tell others. Was that a good idea? Well, it's not a good idea. Like when you're sitting around the Eastern table and one of the kids says, one of these days I'm going to inherit everything from my mom and my dad, not you. It was a wrong idea shared with the wrong people at the wrong time. Second reaction comes from the father, who says, uh, at first he's angry, but then he kind of kept these things. He wondered about that, kept the dream in his heart. Kind of like Mary. Remember when uh, Mary kept these things and pondered them in his heart? And the father, Jacob, knew God was doing something in Joseph's life, and he questioned it, but he just kind of, he pondered it like a good dad. He just kind of thought about it. Third reaction, Joseph shared, his father wondered. Third reaction was that of the brothers. They hated him. They hated the dream. And what's interesting is this, this generational rivalry gets passed now to Jacob's sons, all these 12 sons. Remember Jacob and Esau and the family blessing that got stolen from Esau? That same kind of original sin or sin nature gets passed on from father to son, from generation to generation. But there's something interesting to note as this story continues. Which of those three, Joseph, father, or sons who hated him, which of those three is going to be used by God to accomplish God's purpose? Is it going to be Joseph who has a dream? Is it going to shares it? Is it going to be the father who encourages his son to pursue it? Or is it going to be the brothers who we're the furthest away from God's intent. Actually, it's going to be the brothers who are used to accomplish God's goals. God is going to use those who were furthest away from the story and hated it the most in order to accomplish God's goals. Strange thing about God is that God sometimes works that way. 
God sometimes takes the worst that can happen in our lives and takes it and turns it around and uses it for his good. Watch for that in Joseph's story because at the end of the story, Joseph says in Genesis 50, you know, all that bad stuff that happened to me, all that throwing in the pit and selling into slavery, you meant it for evil, but Joseph says, but God meant it for good. It's the same as the lesson from Romans 8 where the Apostle Paul says, we know that all things work together for good with those who love God who are called according to his purpose. Not all things will be good for those who love God, but all things work together somehow for good with those who love God and are called according to his purpose. So the story of Joseph continues when, while his brothers were keeping sheep a long ways away, and Joseph, the pampered young favorite son, comes to visit them, they take him, they strip him of his robe, uh, they throw him into a pit, and they sell him to a bunch of Midianites who are on their way to Egypt. They kill a goat, they put the blood on, on Joseph's robe and bring it back to Jacob. Jacob recognizes the goat, realizes that his favorite son has been killed and eaten by a wild animal, is what the brothers tell the dad. Joseph is 17 years old. I mean, he just graduated from high school as he's thrown into the pit, sold by the Midianites to an Egyptian official named Potiphar. Joseph works in Potiphar's house, and because Joseph works so well in Potiphar's house, that soon he becomes a manager of Potiphar's household. As he's doing really well managing Potiphar's household, um, a soap opera happens. And Potiphar's wife starts to make innuendos to Joseph, and Joseph says, uh uh, uh uh, not you, baby, I follow God's will. So Potiphar's wife, like the soap opera goes, went and complained about Joseph making passes at her, and Joseph is thrown into jail. But even in jail, we'll talk about this more in the adult forum, about how Joseph kept working despite horrible circumstances and what that means. Even in jail, Joseph rises to the top and becomes a trusted inmate with all of the leadership responsibilities. As he's there in jail, the cupbearer and the baker have these strange dreams. They're in prison for some reason. And they come to Joseph who says, God can interpret these dreams for you. Joseph says that the one man, the cupbearer, will be released very soon and get his job back. While the baker's going to get, he's going to get hanged. Joseph says to the cupbearer as he's released, he says, hey dude, remember me when you get back up in your job. Remember me and how good I was here and how I served God no matter what I was doing. By now, 13 years have passed. Joseph has been in jail for a long time. He's not heard a word from his family or anybody back in the land of Canaan. He's all alone in that jail cell, only him and the Lord who was with him, the Lord who was a living and loving God who was with Joseph. Then after a while, Pharaoh has a dream that he can't interpret. His cupbearer says, oh, wish I had a behave because J Joseph in jail, he can interpret these kind of dreams. So Joseph goes and interprets the dream for Pharaoh that there will be seven years. Remember that? Seven years of plenty, the fat cows and the thin cows. Seven years of plenty, and then seven years of famine. He advises the Pharaoh that, you know, during these years of plenty, store up some of the grain, and so you'll have some left for the seven years of scarcity. So Joseph starts to become an advisor for the Pharaoh and does so well. I and mean, this is the people of Israel in Egypt. And he advises so well that he becomes an authority in Pharaoh's government. And an Egyptian high-ranking official gives Joseph his daughter that becomes Joseph's wife. And he has two sons with her. Joseph becomes fully acculturated with the Egyptian language, dress, shaved head, and beardless. He looks, talks, and walks like an Egyptian, just like everybody else. I might go somewhere. Um, he's an Egyptian. 
So those seven years of bumper crop pass, and the seven years of famine begins, and it strikes all over the whole land. And Joseph's brother and father are still back in Canaan, and they come down to Egypt to buy grain because they don't have any. They didn't plan ahead during those seven years of plenty. Joseph recognizes his brothers who come. By this time, it had been 22 years since they threw him in the pit and sold him, and he thought that now they were just the same people as they were before. Really, Joseph at this point doesn't care much about his brothers, but he cares about Benjamin, his youngest brother. And so the brothers come, he gives them food, and he says, you want food again? You bring your little brother Benjamin back. So when all their food ran out up in the land of Canaan, the brothers knew, the 11 brothers knew that if they were going to survive, they'd have to go back to Joseph. They didn't recognize him at this time. They'd have to go back to Joseph to get grain, and they would have to bring in their little brother, Benjamin. Jacob didn't want to send a little Benjamin because he was now the favorite son, but they brought him with, and when they were down there, they showed a different side of themselves of, than what they were 22 years ago. They begged for Benjamin's life because Joseph said, leave him here, leave him here, and you can go with the food. Judah says, take me instead. Take me instead. Keep me with you. Remember, Jesus came from the line of Judah. So Judah says, take me. I will sacrifice myself for the sake of my younger brother. Joseph hears the men talking about this, and they blame themselves for what happened to Joseph 22 years before. It was a kind of a confession that they had done wrong. Joseph hears their confession and weeps. They still don't recognize him yet. He knew that he has the power to save them and hit his aged father and bring them down to Egypt so that they can survive. In a tearful scene of hugging, kissing, and rejoicing, Joseph says to his brothers, I'm your brother. And they reunite. And they go back and get Jacob and all of their other households and the entire 12 tribes and sons of Israel move down to Egypt to be saved from starvation and extinction. Now they're all down there. All the people of Israel are down living in Egypt, living in their own land that the Pharaoh had given them and in harmony with the Egyptians. At this time, at this time, for a brief shining moment in time, Israel and Egypt were in great harmony. Egypt was good to the land of Jacob and the people of Israel grew and prospered. After 54 years of being there, Joseph knew that he was going to die and in the last paragraph of Genesis, Joseph calls his brothers together and says those important words. That what they intended for evil, God intended for good. Joseph was saying, you know what guys, God is good all the time, and all the time, God is good. So God had taken this one man, Joseph, and turned the evil circumstances into his life into a blessing that eventually saved Israel and allowed them to grow into a powerful and mighty people. God was with Joseph and God was with the people of Israel. I think it's a great story. If you can find Joseph in a multicolored dream coat, especially with Donny Osmond's, I know it's a great, remember that? It was just awesome if you can watch that sometime this week. You'll see how God works in mysterious ways to be perfect, sinful people like us to accomplish great good. God overcomes all obstacles. No power of evil can overcome or stop the power of God. God accomplishes his purposes. The Lord keeps his promises. Jacob, Joseph, Joseph's story is a perfect illustration that all things, not are good, but all things work for good for those who love God and who are called according to his purpose. That is the same way God works today. The same God who works in Joseph's life is still God today. 
He's not changed or grown old or lost his power. No matter what, he can work in your life. He can turn curses in your life into blessings, misfortunes into prosperity, and make all things, even sinful, evil things, work together for good for those who love God. Our God is an awesome God, powerful, loving, creative, creating God. And that God wants to work in your life too. God's story began in creation and continues to work today until that time when we're gathered around his heavenly throne with believers from all nations, tribes, and peoples serving and praising God forever. You know, in tough times, Come in your life, which they will. Remember this story of Joseph. Don't give up. Don't give in. Instead, look up. God is choosing you to play a unique role in the redemption of the world. In the story of Joseph, we see directly again and again that God was with Joseph. And we see the life lesson that the quality of his life depended on how he responded to life's struggles and challenges. So hang in there with God through the ups and the downs, through the blessings and bummers, through the highs and the lows. God did not let Joseph down, and God will not, will not let you down. Let's join in prayer. Gracious God, in the midst of the mess that we sometimes experience in our own lives, help us to develop Joseph's kind of confident faith in your power and your sovereignty. Help us remember that no matter how bad things look in our lower story, that you are always at work for our good. Help us to have faith. Faith to believe that you withhold no good thing from us because you do love us. For God, we pray this all in Jesus' name. Thank you. 
living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Surround Sally and their family 
with love and care and help them know the power of the resurrection. Dear God, we also pray for the family and those who knew little Phoenix Murray Price who was killed on Friday evening. We pray for your grace, your comfort to be in the midst of that tragedy and to be with the, the families who knew her and who loved her and those also who were injured. Dear God, we also pray for the people of Zion today. We also pray for Patty and Meredith and Judy and Bob and Carol and Pastor Reed and Liz and Ruby and Dr. Dick and Helen and Kurt and Lori and Sharon and Carol and George and Laverne and Sandra and those that we hold in our hearts or now name on our lips. Lord. 